Hi everybody, here is a quick little video on recording methods. You guys can look over the objectives. Our agenda is today, we're going to talk about why it's important to collect data, some dimensions of behavior, some data collection methods, and then the practicality of the data collection methods with regards to teaching. So why is it important for us to collect data? And there are a couple of reasons. One is that it allows us to continually evaluate our interventions and our instruction-based methods with learners. And it also keeps us accountable. So in a classroom, how can you remember exactly what words each student has learned to spell on Thursday that that student couldn't spell on Tuesday? Or what improvement each student's made in solving equations from one Friday to the next? And these precise bits of information are the only way that we can tell where progress has been made and what we still need to work on with learners. In addition, it gives us feedback on the effectiveness of the procedures that we're using. And feedback is key to improvement for us as teachers as well to our students. So in monitoring our progress, we might see something that we can improve midstream and getting this feedback of that ongoing evaluation allows us to change what we need to change, if we need to change it. <laughs> um, if you can't change anything in the middle of a term, that's okay. You'll probably teach the same subject again in the future, and you can make those changes the next time you teach it. Feedback also, um, when we get feedback on the effectiveness of the change in the procedures, it shows the student response to intervention that's often requested by supervisors. So it provides us with data to keep us accountable when our supervisors or the IEP team needs it with regards to the response to intervention. So all those things are reasons why we collect data and why it's important to collect data. Here are some dimensions of behavior. I'm going to briefly talk about five of them. First one is frequency, so number of occurrences of, of a behavior, number of times a kid raises their hand, things like that. Rate is the frequency of a behavior during a period of time, so number of math, pack, math packs completed per minute, number of correct spelling words per minute, and things like that. One of the differences between frequency and rate has to deal with the amount of time that you observe. So if you observe a behavior for the same amount of time, then you can use frequency. If you observe it for different amounts of time, then you want to use rate. So for example, say I'm observing the number of times a kid raises their hand, and I'm going to observe for 30 minutes on Monday, 30 minutes on Wednesday, and 30 minutes on Friday. Well, my observation periods are the same amount of time, so I can measure frequency and compare the number of times the kid raises their hand on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. However, if I only observe for 10 minutes on Monday and then 30 minutes on Wednesday, I can't use frequency because I might have gotten two hand raises on Monday, whereas I got 10 on Wednesday, but I observed for longer on Wednesday. So in those instances, I would convert my frequency to rate and I would report the number of hand raises per minute. And that way my observation periods could be different amount of times, different amounts of time, but I could still compare uh, my data across those observation sessions. Duration is gonna be the amount of time an individual engages in a behavior. So the amount of time um, a kid is on task, the amount of time a kid is up out of his seat, things like that. Latency is the length of time between the instructional cue or the antecedent and the occurrence of behavior. So how long does it take a kid to start an assignment? Or if a kid is up wandering around and the teacher asks him to sit down, how long it takes for the kid to actually sit? Force is the intensity or magnitude of the behavior. So sometimes you get kids that um, press down really, really hard on their pencil. That would be an example of force. Or sometimes you have kids that speak really softly when they answer questions, and you might want to raise how loud their voice is, things like that. So those are your seven dimensions. We have some general categories of systems for collecting data. The first one is that you can get written reports, and these are called anecdotal reports. And this is when the teacher, the paraprofessional, whoever's in there, writes a whole report of what's going on with the behavior, um, what's going on in the environment, when the behavior occurs, things like that. 
These reports are really good to identify a target behavior and figure out when it's occurring, under what conditions does it typically occur, and things like that. But you do want to actually observe the behavior. So you use these written reports as a good starting off point um, to tell you what the behavior looks like and when you need to observe. Next, if you have a behavior that leaves a tangible product in the environment that you can go back at a later date and measure, you can use what we call permanent product recording. So this is defined as measuring a behavior by its physical impact on the environment. So like I said, you have a behavior that leaves some type of physical impact on the environment. You can go at a later date and measure that behavior. So take this math worksheet. The kid can go and complete these math problems and it produces this tangible product where you can look at after the class period, at the end of the day, at the end of the night, and you can see how many problems the kid completed and how many problems were correct. So you're measuring something that's left behind. This is really handy for situations when you can't actually directly measure the behavior. Either it's not possible or it's not practical. So in the classroom, when the kid is completing this workbook problem, you probably have tons of things that you need to do. You have 20 other kids in the classroom. So it might not be practical to watch the kid when he completes every single problem to see if they're correct, but you can look at it at the end of the day. And so that's when you would want to use your permanent product recording. This is used very often within the teaching environment um, for academic skills and things like that to record behaviors. Advantages of permanent product recording is that you don't actually have to be continually present, which is awesome. The IOA, which is the reliability, is high. It's affordable, really easy to do. The disadvantage is that you are not directly observing the behavior, and you cannot use prominent, permanent product recording for behaviors that don't produce some type of tangible product in the environment. So if there's nothing left behind after the behavior, then you can't use it. So if you want to record behavior on any type of vocalizations, Vocalizations typically don't <laughs> produce any type of tangible item in the environment, and so that wouldn't be something that you would want to use permanent product recording with. And it may reduce the validity of recording. So since you're recording something, since you're measuring a behavior after the fact, you don't actually know that that person is actually engaging in the behavior. For instance, with that math worksheet, it's possible that Maybe that student had the person behind him do some problems for him. And so if you're not continually recording, then you might actually miss that. Um, I would say it might be pretty unlikely, but it is something to be concerned about. Okay, then you can actually go and directly observe behavior. And if you actually directly observe behavior, we have some systems for doing that. You can do event recording, percentage of opportunities, interval recording, time sampling, duration, and latency recording. So let's go through each of those. With event recording, you're going to use either frequency or rate. You want to use event recording if you can continually record the behavior. So you have an observation of maybe observational period, maybe 15 minutes, and you are continually watching the learner. And every time the behavior occurs, you're going to record it. These are used for discrete behaviors that are short duration. So what we mean by discrete behaviors are behaviors that have a clear start and stop. For example, the kid raising their hand. That's a discrete behavior at short duration. You can clearly see when the kid raises their hand and clearly see when the kid puts their hand down. And if I would be using event recording, here would be an example of a data sheet. So we're going to record on March 15th for 15 minutes. Here's your start and stop time. And then during that 15 minutes, every time little Susie raises her hand, we're going to make a tally mark. And at the end, we're going to record the total number of occurrences. So you guys can see on the 15th for 15 minutes, she raised her hand 23 times. And on the 16th for 15 minutes, she raised her hand 18 times. Now we can use frequency recording for this because our observation times are the same. They're both 15 minutes. If we would have had 15 minutes here and 30 minutes here, then we would have wanted to convert this to rate because our observation periods were different amounts of time. So we would have converted this to the number of hand raises per minute. All right, advantages is that it's really accurate, it's really easy. Disadvantage is that it's time consuming. So for that 15 minutes or for that 30 minutes, however long your observation period is, you have to continually watch the learner. 
Do not use this for high rate behaviors or long duration behaviors. So those both require different observational systems. You can also do opportunity recording. So opportunity recording is when you produce opportunities for the learner to engage in the behavior. We've talked about a three-term contingency. This is when, it, when you're going to when the teacher is going to present some type of instruction or antecedent. The kid will engage in a behavior, and you'll provide a consequence, or there will be some type of consequence. Typically, these are done in sessions. So one session would be 20 trials, for instance, if you look at this data sheet. And for this data sheet, the materials presented were restaurant containers, salt, pepper, sugar, ketchup, mustard, napkins. The behavior was sorting. So the teacher presented these items to the learner and asked them to sort. And if they performed correctly, you had a circle. And if they did not perform correctly, then there is um, a little slash through there. So you can see for each session, the trials in which the kid responded correctly or engaged in the correct behavior or did not engage in correct behavior. Um, you can also do this with maybe numbers. If you have flashcards with numbers one through 10, put them in front of the kid, tell them to sort or put them in order and they get it correct, they get praise um, and they get a circle. If they don't, they get a slash. And so example of opportunity recording. If you can't continually watch the kid and see if they're engaged in the behavior, you can do what we call interval recording and time sampling. And this is when you take your observation period and you divide it into a number of short intervals. So this is what's referred to as a discontinuous recording procedure because you monitor the behavior, but you don't have to actually watch the whole time. You wanna use this with continuous behaviors, so more of your long duration behaviors or high frequency behaviors. So there are three different types of, two different types of interval and then a time sampling method. So we have partial interval recording and you're going to divide your observation period into intervals. So say we're gonna observe for a minute and we divide that minute into 10 second intervals. If a behavior occurs at all during the 10 second intervals, you're gonna put a plus. And if the behavior does not occur at all, you're gonna put a minus. With whole interval recording, if the behavior occurs in the entire interval, you're gonna put a plus. If the behavior stops at all during the interval, then you're gonna put a minus. And then momentary time sampling, if you're just gonna basically sample time, <laughs> essentially. So you're just gonna look at what happens at the end of the interval. If you go through the 10 seconds, at the end of the 10 seconds, if the behavior is occurring, you put a plus. If the behavior is not occurring, you put a minus. So let's look at all these. Here is a data sheet and here's your behavior. So when it's raised and filled in and shaded, the behavior is occurring. When it drops down and it's not shaded, the behavior is not occurring. Okay, we have a minute observation period that's divided into 10 second intervals. So for the first 10 seconds for partial interval recording, we're gonna see if the behavior occurs at all during the interval. Um, it has occurred, so we put a plus. Second interval, yes, it, we see it occurring at least once, so put a plus. Third interval, doesn't occur at all, so get the minus. Fourth interval, yeah, it occurs at the beginning. Fifth interval, it occurs. And sixth interval, it occurs. Now, whole interval recording, it has to occur for the whole interval to get the plus. So first interval, it occurs for the whole thing, get the plus. Second interval, it doesn't occur for some of it, so it gets a minus. Third interval doesn't occur at all. Fourth interval, it doesn't occur for a portion of it, so you get a minus. Fifth interval occurs the whole time, and sixth interval doesn't occur at the end, so you get a minus. Momentary time sampling, we're just worried about what happens at the end of the interval. So at the end of the, this 10 second interval, it's occurring, so you get a plus. End of the second interval, it's occurring, so you get a plus. End of the third interval, it's not occurring, so you get a minus. End of the fourth interval, it's occurring, so you get a plus. End of the fifth interval, it's occurring, so you get a plus. And end of the sixth interval, it's not occurring, so you get a minus. Okay, um, some advantages and disadvantages of these methods. With your interval recordings, 
a lot of times the intervals are shorter compared to time sampling. So a lot of times when you use momentary time samplings, the intervals are maybe a minute long, whereas partial or whole interval, your intervals are typically 10 seconds or 30 seconds long. Um, some of these methods will either overestimate or underestimate behavior. So if we look at partial interval recording, to figure out how, if we, okay, so if we look at how much the behavior is actually occurring throughout this interval, it's occurring about 65%. So if we look at partial interval recording, we're going to take the number of intervals that we have a plus, which is 5, and divide it by the total number of intervals and multiply by 100. And that's going to tell us if we use partial interval recording, we're saying that the behavior is occurring 83% of the time. And you can see that that's actually overestimating the actual percent of when the behavior is occurring. So partial interval recording typically overestimates. I'll give you guys another example. The behavior could occur maybe once in each of these intervals. And so in actuality, it could occur very little throughout the whole interval. But since it occurred once in each of these intervals, you could have a plus for each interval and you could actually say the behavior occurred 100% where it, in actuality it actually didn't. With whole interval recording, whole interval recording typically underestimates behavior. So if we do the same thing in this example, we said that it occurs in two out of the six intervals, which would be 33%. Well, you can see that it really underestimates the actual amount of the time that behavior is occurring. Um, so partial interval overestimates whole interval actually underestimates. And then momentary time sampling is actually pretty accurate. So we said it occurred in four out of the six intervals, so 67%, and actual occurrence is 65%. So just some advantages and disadvantages of those. Here's another example of an interval recording data sheet. There were one minute, um, or sorry, 10 second intervals, and behavior occurred. Got a plus, behavior didn't occur, you got a minus. Okay, with duration and latency recording, you're typically recording, or you are recording the amount of time. So here's a typical latency data sheet. You would put the date, the delivery of the instruction, and when the behavior started, and then you get a count of a time of how long it took the behavior to occur. And you can either report it in the number of seconds or the number of minutes, or you can get an average number of seconds or minutes. Duration is similar. You put the date, you put what time the behavior starts, what time the behavior stops, and you get either the total duration of the behavior um, or you can get an average duration. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the practicality of these recording systems with regards to teaching. So here's a little flow chart from the LeBlanc article that's in your module. And I think it's really good. I think it allows you to really look at these recording systems and figure out which one is good to use, not just in theory, but in practicality. You know, when we're talking about event recording, that's a continuous recording procedure. Do you actually have time? Is it practical for you to watch the student the whole time while you're teaching when you have to get up there and lecture or monitor group activities or pay attention to 20 other kids in your class, it can be hard. And so I think it's really important to be aware of these recording systems and the resources that they require because you might have a behavior specialist come in your class or a BCBA and want you to do event recording. And so I think it's important for you to know what that entails so you can say, hey, that's not practical for me can we do partial interval recording or momentary time sampling? Um, and that is completely okay for you to do. So let's go through this flowchart. That'll help you guys. First of all, can you observe the problem behavior? If you can't, does it produce something tangible in the environment? If it does, you can use your permanent product recording. If it doesn't, you'll have to brainstorm and figure something else out. If you can observe the behavior, then is the behavior discrete and countable? So does it have a clear start and stop? Um, if it does, then do you have the resources to count each instance of that problem behavior? If you do, then you want to look at, okay, the, can the problem behavior occur at any time or just when I present an opportunity? If it can't occur at 
at any time, only when you present an opportunity, then you want to use that percentage of opportunity or the opportunity recording. If it can occur at any time, so it's not contingent on you providing an instruction, then you want to look at your dimensions of behavior and figure out um, which dimension of behavior are you measuring, duration, latency, intensity, and or are you going to use your event recording. Let's go back up here. Um, if it is discrete, but you don't have the resources to count each instance, then you want to go over here and you want to figure out, okay, do I have the resources to actually monitor the behavior? So not record each instance, but at least monitor it. If you do, then you can use partial interval or even whole interval. If you don't, then you really want to look at momentary time sampling, where, you know, if you have a minute interval, you can have a little timer on your belt or on your pants. Timer goes off. Look and see if the kid's engaged in the behavior. They get a plus or a minus, and you move on for the next minute. So really taking these observation systems and looking at what's practical. You know, can you count each behavior? No. Can you monitor the behavior? Yes or no. And that can kind of tell you what recording system to use. All right, guys. So we talked about why we collect data. We talked about the dimensions of behavior. We talked about five of them. And then we talked about these different data collection systems. So permanent product, event, opportunity recording, interval, time sampling, duration, and latency. And then we talked a little bit about teaching in these recording systems, um, knowing the practicality of them, knowing what they entail, what resources they entail to figure out which one best captures your behavior and which one can you actually do in a practical manner. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you have any questions about what we talked about, please email me. All right. Thanks, guys.